heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 262, covering the week of May 17th through May 21st, 2021. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Facebook page, and subscribe to our YouTube page. You can find all those social media accounts at our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. While you're there, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. It's a great book by 20 Abbeville Institute scholars and yours free of charge simply for giving us an email address. If you give us that email address, you'll get our Daily Dose of Dixie five days a week, usually Monday through Friday, but sometimes Tuesday through Saturday. We'll also communicate with you on other things we have going on. For example, our webinars. We have a webinar coming up May 26th. It is on the Anti-Federalists, and it is a webinar presented by yours truly and also featuring Aaron Coleman. Now, you may not have heard of Aaron Coleman, and that's okay, but Aaron Coleman wrote a great book about the Anti-Federalist tradition. He is on our side when it comes to the ideas of the Constitution and federalism and limited government. He is a great scholar in the academy, which we're going to talk about this week. It's rare to find these people. And so come on out and support Aaron Coleman. Tickets are 10 bucks. We have about, I think, 40 left for the event. So if you're getting this and it's on you know Friday or Saturday of this week before the event, Hopefully we'll have less than 40 left when, when we get to that point when you listen to the podcast. But come on over, 10 bucks, you get in the door, plus you'll get the replay free of charge. We'll talk with Aaron for about an hour, Dr. Coleman, about an hour. Uh, and these webinars are fantastic. We do them once a month. So usually they sell out so fast I don't have time to talk about them on the podcast. But this is a great opportunity to see what we do. And then you're on that email list so you can get those webinars and get the announcement for those webinars when they come out, and you can hop on it right away. If you've never attended one before, this is a good time to do it. And We're going to have one again in June and July. We're going to do this every month. So uh, these things are fantastic. And again, you help support those endeavors by giving us a tax-deductible donation. So we also exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like what we do, if you like our website, our podcast, our conferences, we have our summer school coming up, which is now sold out. If you like our webinars, if you like all this stuff, then please consider a tax-deductible donation to the Institute. Also, click on that Shop tab at uh, abbevilleinstitute.org. You can get our logo and all kinds of cool stuff. So uh, shirts, golf, uh, golf shirts, hats, it's embroidered. It's good stuff. We've got a lot of great things going on at the Institute, and we do appreciate every dollar that you contribute. No amount is too little. Or, I mean, no amount is unwelcomed. If you can only donate a couple of bucks, do it. I mean, what is the Southern tradition worth to you? Of course, we'll take a lot more than that if you can. But if you only got a couple of dollars, or if you only have a couple of dollars a month, we appreciate all the support you can give us. Uh, that means a lot to us. And so uh, click on that support tab at abbevilleinstitute.org. I'm having a hard time saying that today. abbevilleinstitute.org and uh, help us out there. Also go to abbevilleacademy.org and you can purchase any of these webinars we've done for $15. Uh, the last, I think we've done five now. So this is our sixth webinar coming up. And they're, they're great stuff. So go on out there and do that. All right, let's talk about the material for the week. And the Academy is front and center this week at the Abbeville Institute. And we're going to start with the Wednesday piece uh, this was a piece actually first appeared at lewrockwell.com, so I have to give a plug to Lou Rockwell. If you don't read lewrockwell.com, he often uh, publishes our material over there, but he has a lot of other great stuff. And this particular piece is a defense of Marco Bassani. Now, Marco Bassani just wrote our latest publication for Abbeville Press, and it is Chaining Down Leviathan. And uh, this came out about a month ago. It is a great book. We're excited to have it at the Abbeville Institute. And uh, Marco Bassani, of course, has taken a lot of flack, not because of this book, but because of his views. And he teaches in Italy. He is a professor in Italy. And just like in the United States, the academy all over the world, particularly in Europe, is saturated with a bunch of woke idiots. 
It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter if you're talking about the academy here in the United States. It doesn't matter if you're talking about the academy in the North, the South, the West. It doesn't matter if you're talking about the academy in Europe, Italy, Britain, Germany. It doesn't matter. You've got woke idiots all over the place. And I think it's because this is just what the academy produces. So it's rare. I mentioned this. It's rare to have professors who teach in the academy who are not uh, completely destroyed by wokeness. And this even has to do with the quote-unquote conservatives who often teach at these academies, uh, in these academies, like uh, Alan Gelzo, right, who is a woke conservative. This is what he is. Now, you, of course, he would, no, 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 I'm not, no, I'm not. But when the man can't find a Confederate monument, he doesn't want to tear down. Or uh, when he runs around promoting uh, 19th century reformists as conservatives, well, I mean, you have a real problem there. This is what R. L. Dabney pointed out. Conservatism is not really conservative anymore. It doesn't conserve anything. It just adopts the latest trend from the left, or the discarded trend from the left, uh, and and moves along with that, while the left is pushing forward something else. There's no there's no conservative tradition in America if that's what you're going to do. So Bassani got in hot water a few months back after the election of Joe Biden, and um, on his personal his personal Facebook account, he posted a meme of Kamala Harris, which called attention to rumors that had circulated that she had engaged in some uh, inappropriate things while she was moving up the political ranks in California. And that, that was the reason why she attained any power that she had in California. And then Therefore, and I'm going to read what the well, I'm not going to read what the meme said because this is a family-friendly show. I'm going to read some of this letter that comes out of this post. But he posted this meme on his personal Facebook page, and as a result, the institution that he works for, the university, decided to uh, conduct an investigation into this, and they have since ruled that Bassani will be docked a month's pay for posting a meme. Now think about this. This is where we are in 2021. This is ludicrous, laughable, and stupid. But the social justice warriors think this is probably, yes, yes, yes. They probably thought he should have gotten banned for a year, maybe longer, fired for this. And we know that there have been much more severe penalties for other things. But the fact is, for a meme, a political meme on your personal, personal account, on a social media account. He is now docked a month's pay. And he, he remarked that he's glad, and I want to read some of this, he's glad that it happened to him in his 50s because if this was a younger professor, he already has tenure, if it was a younger professor, they would just their career would, career would have been over. So this is the kind of power the academy has because when you go into the academy, I mean, and you don't have tenure, and you, you're just trying to make it, which is a tough, tough situation, anyways, and it's made even worse by the oppressive cancel culture and political correctness in these institutions. They are filled with a bunch of thin-skinned nincompoops who have no sense of humor, no self-awareness. They're little power-hungry tyrants is what they are, typically. Now, that's not the case in every institution, and uh, it's not the case with everybody that works in the academy, of course. But a lot of these academies are saturated with this stuff. A lot of these schools, universities, doesn't matter where you are, again, they're saturated. So let me read this piece by uh, uh, Joanne, Joanne Cavallo, who is a professor at Columbia University. She's a professor of Italian at Columbia University. And she writes, You may remember a meme circulating widely after the U.S. presidential election last November with a picture of Kamala Harris and the following comment. So I'm not going to read exactly what it said. But again, if you do things that are immoral, you too can play second fiddle to a man with dementia. It's basically a Cinderella story. I mean, this was the meme. It was a joke, right? It was a joke. The political theorist and historian Marco Bassani, professor of history and political theory in Italy, was uh, one of many who reposted the meme on a personal social media page. When this was brought to the attention of his university, the administration initiated disciplinary proceedings that finally reached a conclusion 
this past week after over six months. The verdict, reported in the Italian news, was that Professor Bassani was found guilty of sharing sexist and highly offensive content not only toward the, the directly interested party, but toward the entire female gender. As punishment, his university teaching and salary were suspended for one month. Yet apparently, the penalty was apparently not for reposting the meme in question, but for the nature of his social media posts more generally, since the press release relates that he was also told what happened did, does not constitute an isolated episode, since it is your custom to publicly express strong opinions on social networks, sometimes with extreme content. Now you see, here we go. So your job at a university, which is supposed to have academic freedom, um, supposed to have academic freedom, is now uh, being monitored and, of course, censored by a university. So you are supposed to have academic freedom, but you don't really have it. And that is the sad part of all this. Professor Bassana reacted to the sentence with the following statement, as reported in the press. This clearly shows that I have been punished because I am not aligned with the banalities of the contemporary post-left. Furthermore, the verdict has already been written even before the commission was created. In the end, it is good that, I happen to me, that it happened to me since I am over 50 years old and a full professor. Had it happened to a young scholar at the beginning of their career, they would have been shredded to pieces. But I want to turn this madness into a battle in defense of the values of freedom because this new inquisition is really dangerous. Well, I agree. It is really dangerous. Professor Bassani's Italian colleagues are in the process of writing an open letter that they will circulate widely and ask supporters to sign in a gesture of solidarity. They have also set up a venue to collect donations to help offset the legal fees required to fight against this measure. So there is a link to that in this article if you are interested in donating to that to help out Professor Bassani. But here we go. I mean, you've published something on a personal page. This is why I would recommend on your personal pages... Um, if it's really personal, you you limit who can see things. And you decide, I mean, limit what you post to, but you really limit what you can see. Now, um, some of us don't necessarily have that luxury any longer, but um, it's, uh, it's certainly important that um, you take this to heart. Uh, now, thankfully, here in the United States, I think this would be a little harder to do. Um, because of some legal safeguards, but you never know. You never know here in the U.S. But uh, Miss Cavallo, or Dr. Cavallo, has then published her letter that she sent to an Italian publication. I'm going to read this, and this is going to help segue into something else. Open letter to the president of the state uh, of State University of Milan, Professor e Elio Franzini. Although I have never had the privilege of meeting Professor Marco Bassani in person, I'm an admirer of his scholarly work, in particular, Liberty, State, and Union, the political theory of Thomas Jefferson, and most recently, Chaining Down Leviathan, the American Dream of Self-Government. In addition, we are friends on Facebook, where I value his wit and perceptiveness in posting comments, news, and memes on hotly debated topics of contemporary relevance. When I heard the commotion last fall simply because Professor Bassani had reposted a meme on his personal Facebook page, I considered it an attempt to intimidate him for having expressed his opinion publicly, but I honestly did not expect the fuss to amount to anything concrete. Now, however, that disciplinary proceeding at the university has resulted in actual punishment in the form of a month's suspension of his teaching and salary. I feel the moral obligation to register my shock and disagreement and to urge a repeal of the sentence against him. According to the press, you deemed that the meme in question contained sexist and highly offensive content, not only toward the directed interested party, but toward the entire female gender. I cannot speak for others, but frankly, I find the charge that the meme was detrimental to the dignity of women to be absurd. As a woman, and in particular as an American woman, I can assure you that the post was not in the least detrimental to my dignity. Indeed, I would call the content not at all sexist, but rather feminist. Anyway, this is true, right? Old feminists would have said, well, this person... If if uh, if this is what women are going to get, second fiddle, and you did these things which feminists have decried for years, well then, that would make it in line with old school feminism. But, of course, that's not the case any longer. In any case, putting all the focus on the question of gender diverts attention away from the issues of political corruption and conflict of interest that the meme raises. 
In fact, and I say this as a scholar of language and literature, if an entire group were implicitly the target, it would not be the female gender, but instead the political class. And that's true. But I'm writing not to defend the meme per se, but rather to defend Professor Bassani's fundamental right to repost it on his personal Facebook page without fear of a reprisal of any kind from his employer today or in the future. I cannot believe that such a fundamental right to expression can be denied to a professor at an Italian university. Now, this is interesting because, of course, one of the things in the United States, we have the, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which has then covered all kinds of things that are now protected speech, protected classes, and political speech is not protected. And that should happen in the future because of things like this. Of course, they would say that you can help your political positions, but if we're, I mean, this is the most important speech to protect. It's why the First Amendment is there, and of course, why state constitutions adopted the same or the language. This is the important part about it. Because political speech is speaking truth to power. Whether you're on the left or the right, or in the middle, it doesn't matter, but when you're saying things about someone you oppose with power, that has to be protected. Because if not, power is simply going to run you over. These are the most important things to protect. A meme often functions as a shorthand way to bring to mind and comment upon serious issues that are of public knowledge or otherwise been treated at greater length in previous venues. And in fact, the widely circulated meme that Professor Bassani reposted on his page drew attention to Vice President Kamala Harris's rise to power that had been examined in detail and criticized in earlier publications. The meme did so using sarcasm, which, like satirical humor more generally, has a venerable role in speaking truth to power throughout the ages, including and especially in the history of Italian culture and literature. Today, however, this freedom is increasingly threatened if one's opinions do not coincide with those that dominate in political institutions, the press, and even, and even academia. This right of expression must therefore be safeguarded and defended with even greater tenacity. I agree. If not reversed, this sanction will engender, I'm sorry, endanger the freedom of speech of us all, already abolished in a large part of the world, where academics in particular are often prohibited from expressing their opinions freely. It could also lead that much faster to a world in which those who have to hold the monopoly on legalized violence can act with impunity, also thanks to the cover of those who should protect independent thinking, without having their actions scrutinized or censored. In the grand scheme of things, it is certainly a much graver injustice that today's whistleblowers and courageous investigative journalists who have exposed criminal acts are imprisoned or forced to live in exile while the corrupt power brokers who carry out misdeeds of all kinds are not held accountable and are instead shielded from the consequences of their wrongdoings. All the same, I really wonder how we've arrived at the situation in which, in a country that considers itself free, someone can be sanctioned simply for having reposted a meme on their personal Facebook page. In the Italian press, I read that the commission's assault on free speech was justified by the university's rule that one must avoid damage to the image and reputation of the university. For me, it's clear that the reputation of the University of Milan was not at all damaged by reposting of a meme on the part of Professor Bassani, who has a right to express himself freely. On the contrary, what gravely harmed the reputation of the university was the infliction of an unjustifiable punishment that made their disciplinary proceedings seem more like the persecution of of his political ideas. And I mean, this is 100% accurate. But this is where we are in the profession. This is where we are in the establishment academy. And it's disgusting. And it doesn't matter if you're on the left or the right. And I think, you know, a piece kind of piggybacking on this this week is Ryan Walter's piece, Make History History Again. And he talks about his experiences in graduate school and what that was like as a young graduate student going into a university history department and being uh, inundated with the woke text. Now, look, this has been going on for a long time. I remember as a graduate student decades ago, <laughs> as a joke, now the professor, I had to do this as a joke, where slave hairstyles were a form of resistance. Now, the professor laughed at this, and it it wasn't Clyde Wilson, so he was one of my professors, of course, my advisor in graduate school. But it was another professor there at South Carolina laughed at this and said, this is, this is ridiculous. And, of course, in another uh, course, there was a, another conservative professor I had. Now, this professor was not conservative, but he at least was concerned about how stupid history was becoming. But then there was another professor who talked about how the, the uh, Foucault effect, which is Foucault is a very famous academic 
who is contributing or has contributed to the idea that all these very slim monographs that you get and examining one little thing and and uh, all this disjointed history, and you get people that are specialists in the history of hairstyles, but they don't know much about anything else. I see this all the time. I'm an expert. I'm a professor of history, yet they have no clue about what they're talking about in the broad perspective of things. But, of course, they're going to assign all of the current literature, which is idiotic. And, of course, Walters points this out. He has a number of titles that he was assigned. Uh, Gender and Jim Crow, Women, Women and the Politics of White Supremacy in North Carolina, Manliness and Civilization, A Cultural History of Gender and Race in the United States, The Wages of Whiteness, Race and the Making of the American Working Class. These are some real page turners, he, spe- he said. You don't look at any primary documents, you read all of this garbage. Or Turning the Tables, Restaurants and the Rise of the American Middle Class. Consider the Fork, A History of How We Cook and Eat. Babysitter, An American History, The Lavender Scare, The Cold War Persecution of Gays and Lesbians in the Federal Government, and Constructing Pacification, Masculinity in the Vietnam War. Yeah, I mean, great stuff, right? These are things that are being taught. Now, he wasn't assigned these, but these are things that are being taught all across universities, all across America. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. But this is the problem. We don't actually get real history. And he talks about courses that are not to be outdone. Kansas University offers a woke history course called Angry White Male Studies. UC Santa Barbara even has a course on the history of surfing, while UC Berkeley tops out with a history of weaving. Perhaps they could combine the two courses and one could actually take underwater basket weaving. Right? This is something that was a joke. History courses like these are usually in addition to all the anti-American diatribes one must also endure, like Francis Jennings, author of such works as The Invasion of America, Indians, Colonialism, and the Cant of Conquest, The Creation of America Through Revolution Empire, and The Founders of America, which gives the notable distinction to the native peoples who first inhabited the North American continent. So this is the kind of stuff you get in the modern academy, and it's no wonder that these people would attack Marco Bassani for simply posting a meme that is critical of the left. And that's essentially what this is about. He posted not just this meme, but other things he said that are critical of the left. And so you get out and people scour his pages and they find, oh my gosh, I hate this stuff. And so they're going to try to censor him. They're going to dock his pay for a month. But again, where does academic freedom fall in this? We know in the United States we have academic freedom in the classroom. But as, a per, as an individual in a free federal republic, you should have the ability to speak and say what you think outside of your employer. It doesn't reflect on your employer. Unless you're directly talking about your employer at all times and saying, I'm speaking for them, which, of course, none of us ever do when we're not on the campus or on, in, on the job. We don't do that. So separating public and private life is very important. On the job and off the job is very important. These are things that are necessary. And I, But, I mean, we've got these horrible situations in the academy, and it's just disgusting why anybody would want to get involved with these things anymore. It's, it's beyond me. Uh, but when you have the academy like this, it is, it is just awful. And then you have, of course, the attack that was leveled against me by the conservatives, the Claremontistas, the Straussians, the Jaffaites. And we had a piece on Monday by Enoch Cade, who took to task Michael Anton for doing this. And, of course, more importantly, Harry Jaffa. Now, I've gotten into this myself in my own podcast, and so... Uh, this piece is good, though. Uh, Kate is a good writer. And um, he says a couple of funny things in here. He says, Anton recently thundered against Cracker Jack Claremontism, the fake, pulpy, distorted thumbnail version of Claremontism. Who did this? Prager, Mark Levin? I want names. Give me names. He writes in an essay called Americans Unite, 
that to extent that to the extent that my school or myself had anything to do with propagating this garbage, and that extent is not zero, I sincerely apologize. Furthermore, some of us have been trying to make amends by telling a fuller account of the story, emphasizing those points left out of the Cracker Jack comic, correcting old errors and making new friends. Nevertheless, he says his commitment to the core tenets of Claremont's teaching has never shaken. On that, ta- on that note, Anton directs a barrage of ire towards Brian McClanahan, yours truly, of the Abbeville Institute. McClanahan had the temerity, you see, to challenge in a recent Chronicles article the historiography of the 1776 Commission. McClanahan's attack on it is harmful, Anton says. McClanahan engaged in a deliberate fratricide. He gives aid and comfort to those who hate America. How dare you question the professor, you, you Calhounite. And of course, he's talking about Jaffa. I still hope to gain more paleo friends and help broaden the pro-American populist nationalist coalition on the right, Anton sniffs. I hope this piece serves to that end. Clearly, McClanahan and Chronicles won't be coming along for the ride. At this point, Cade writes, I must confess, I burst into peals of sardonic laughter. My dear Mr. Anton, Professor Jaffa and the Claremonters made careers out of demonizing the South, declaring our Confederate ancestors as heretics far beyond the pale of civilized society. And you're surprised we decline to share Shiraz and Canopies in Claremont banquet rooms. I doubt you like it when grubby peasants cast doubt on the brilliance of Professor Jaffa or the world historical significance of the man who read the Bible by firelight in a hovel in Kentucky. Of course, that would be Abraham Lincoln. The great Emmy Bradford had a lot to say about Jaffa's metaphysics, including the following, The Heresy of Equality, published in 1976, Behind the Call to Equality. The chief, if not only tenant in Professor Jaffa's theology and his link to the pseudo-religious politics of equality, is an even more sinister power. The uniformitarian hatred of providential distinctions, which will stop at nothing less than what Eric Vogelin calls a reconstitution of being. The theology of of Professor J, and by extension uh, the teachings of Claremont are, as Bradford and Wilmore Kendall observed, Nothing less than a call for permanent revolution, an eternal crusade toward an unattainable utopia. And one does not need philosophical training to conclude that egalitarian theology, whether founded in natural law or a materialist interpretation of history, always ends in terror, blood, and fire. So this is the point. I mean, these are people on the right, and they're attacking us. We have no friends on the left or the right. If you're in line with us, the paleo-conservatives, the paleo-libertarians, the Abbeville Institute, you are being hit from both sides at all times. Which means that you're saying the right things. It always does. It means you're saying the right things. It means that you're really defending something. If you don't have anybody attacking you, you're not really defending anything. And while the Claremont uh, acolytes could say the same thing because the left attacks them, and of course we attack them as well, so maybe they're saying the right things. And in reality, even as Cade says, look, we're, we're, we are understanding that we're both being attacked, but we have to get the story right or it doesn't make any sense. As I said in that piece, in my piece of Chronicles, you open yourself up to attack. Or as I'll say in an upcoming piece, you open yourself up. This is the problem. By not saying, not, not being accurate about what you're saying, you're creating a situation where you're going to be laughed at. Now, that said, um, just a couple of other pieces this week. We had a really good book review. It's, day, uh, it's a review of David Gordon's book, Secession, State, and Liberty, a collection of essays. And this is something the Institute has always been interested in, of course. This is a 1998 book by Transaction Publishers. And that's the constitutional question of secession, the philosophical, the moral question of secession. In academic terms, we've been really interested in this. What does it actually mean for the future of the world? Not just the United States, but of the world. We look at self-determination and we think about political secession, personal secession, these type of things. And it's something libertarians and paleoconservatives have a lot in common uh, in these discussions of self-determination and individual liberty. Richard Weaver, Mel Bradford. I mean, Richard Weaver, as I had an essay a couple of weeks ago, uh, 
with his conservative as defender of liberty and how he was aligning himself in many ways with libertarians at that point in his career in the 1960s, just before he died. But we certainly have this carryover. And so I think that this review by Terry Halsey on this book is very good. Of course, you can get the book free of charge at Mises.org, and he gives a link to that, Secession, State, and Liberty. So that's great. Anytime you can have free material, it's fantastic. You want free stuff. don't have to pay for it. And then last but not least, I want to talk about the piece by uh, Avriel uh, Kessler, Listening to Miss Eudora. I want to read this. It's very short, but I want to read this because it, it's what the Institute does besides the political stuff, besides the historical material. One of the things we're committed to here is defending something, or at least critically examining something, and that, of course, is Southern culture and Southern tradition. We explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, and part of that is music and literature and art. And this piece is on Eudora Welty, and I love it. It's a great little story, and I want to read it in its entirety as we wrap up this week. So she writes, For Christmas I gave my granddaughter a compilation of Eudora Welty's novels. She's an avid reader and tore into the book as soon as she unwrapped it. The short stories, however, were not included. Yesterday we drove to a large national bookstore chain to purchase one of Miss Welty's finest Why I Live at the P.O. After a thorough search of the shelves, I couldn't find any of Miss Welty, Miss Welty's works, so I approached the young woman standing behind the customer service desk. May I help you, she asked me. She was mid-twenties, long straight hair, buddy holly glasses, and a serious expression. Where are Eudora Welty's books, I inquired. Who? Eudora Welty, I repeated. I don't think I know her, the young woman replied. My mental thermometer rose. I swallowed the word idiot and plowed ahead. She's a well-known Mississippi writer, I continued. Oh, her eyebrows arched. Let me check my computer. As her hands flew over the info keyboard, she asked, Welty? Yes, I answered. Eudora Pulitzer Welty. I didn't shout, but I wanted to. My granddaughter wondered why her docile nanny was on fire. Can you spell that, she asked. W-E-L-T-Y, I answered. Um, I don't see anything here, the clerk said. Luckily, the store manager saw the unfolding drama and intervened. Yes, Eudora Welty, she said. What a great writer. I'll look. After a second computer search, the manager reported that the store no longer carried Miss Welty's works. My granddaughter was disappointed, and so was I. I'll order it for you, I said. Then I told her about one of the most wonderful experiences in my reading life. I was young, not growing up young, but newly married young. A women's club in Jackson invited Miss Welty to appear and read Why I Live at the P.O. A series of excellent English teachers and had talked about her for years, along with other magical Mississippi names such as William Faulkner, Shelby Foote, and Walker Percy. My seventh grade teacher danced around Tennessee Williams, but was careful not to discuss the content of his work. Each teacher explained that our small, poor state was a workshop of artistic excellence and a repository of brilliant writers. Fires, floods, tornadoes, or a resurgence of the Black Plague would not keep me from hearing Miss Welty. It happened one evening in October. Our large meeting room lacked a stage, billowing curtains, or artful potted palms, but it was, a, was full as an open-up-the-folding-chairs revival. In the center, Miss Welty sat in an overstuffed armchair, holding her words in her lap. She was a thin, gray-haired woman with a soft voice and an expressive face. She thanked us for inviting her, then lifted her book and began to read. Within minutes, it was the 4th of July in China Grove, Mississippi. Sister and Stella Rondo were at it again. Papa, Daddy had not shaved, and the elusive Mr. Whitaker remained elusive. What a delight. After Miss Welty finished her story and Sister had established herself in the P.O., we rose as, in, as one and gave her a rousing standing ovation. As I was driving home, I began to wonder how this talented woman created such a fascinating story. Miss Welty was a photographer as well as a writer. Both skills were beyond comparing. As she traveled the state as a WPA agent, the seeds of her stories walked right in front of her. Sometimes they smiled and waved. Her razor-sharp mind cobbled those seeds into amazing stories. Just my guess, but it seems plausible. Bravo for one of Mississippi's first lady of literature. I wish she was still living on Pinehurst Street, puttering in her garden and blessing us with a torrent of stories. Another question, how does it happen here? After long years of reading, writing, and just looking around, I'm convinced Mississippi is a blend of fiction and an, with an element of truth, as well as truth mixed with an element of fiction. 
both aching to be told. It's waking up early before it gets hot and the sky is a patchwork of pink and blue. It's a blended aroma of sweet olive, honeysuckle, and dirt mixed with the pounding rain. It's telling a tale from way back before anyone forgets. Here we are, story people. It's innate, born in our blood, inherited from southern soil and nourished by time. We have history, too, sometimes joyful, sometimes accompanied by great pain, but ours. Although Mississippi provides an abundance of inspiration, writing about it can be difficult. The task requires opening a vein, bleeding words, and spreading them out for all to see. It's an exposure of the soul. As Miss Welty said, no art ever came out by not risking your neck. Fortunately, many of our homegrown folks have taken that risk. I pity the clerk in the bookstore. She missed a lot, and I truly hope she's not going for a master's degree in English literature. Maybe W-E-L-T-Y will remain in her brain, and she'll take a risk, too. Until next time, good day.